<laughs> oh, I had to bring back uh, the theme music from the sitcom Magnum P.I., uh, uh, one of my favorite sitcoms growing up, and unfortunately, I think you guys are a little too young to recall the, the young Tom Selleck, uh, but a great, great TV show, and uh, and uh, the reason we bring that up is because we're going to talk about the derivative of an inverse function, and the, the formula we use to find this derivative is kind of a funky one, and uh, the acronym... Uh, PI is going to help us remember that the prime, F prime, comes first and F, N, F inverse comes second in that crazy formula. Well, there are a lot of times this year where we, we've taken the time to kind of prove things, and, and this is no exception here. This is one of my favorite proofs of all, of all time throughout the year, and I'm going to take a moment here just to regroup and go through that proof because I think it is uh, very, very meaningful to do so. When you um, finished Algebra 2, you had a property that said f of f inverse of x equaled something really special every time. And the composition of those two functions produced x every single time. So we started with that as our base. And then we said, you know what, we're going to take the derivative of both sides. And it got pretty interesting on the right side because we had the outer function f and then we had the inner function f inverse. And so to derive that side, we had to do some chain rule. So we've got the derivative of the outer function. Leave the inner one alone for now. And now we need to take the derivative of what was inside. And because the notation was so overwhelming, we literally said d over dx instead of trying to throw a prime on top of that negative 1. And then what does it equal? Of course, well, the derivative of x is, with respect to x is just a 1. Well, the whole key here today is that we're trying to solve for this little piece right here. That's the derivative of the inverse function. So we simply took the other component and divided it over. And so we said the derivative of f inverse is always going to be 1 divided by a special composition, f prime of f inverse of x. And I ran out of room there a little bit, but that's the special formula we're going to use. And uh, it's kind of an unusual one, but we'll get a little practice using it here. Well, just before we jump into our first example, I want to also revisit another really important property from Algebra 2 that's going to play a role today. And that's the property that says, well, if f of a equals b then we automatically know for sure that f inverse of b must equal what? Well, yeah, of course, a. So basically we're saying if the ordered pair a comma b falls on f, then we also know that the ordered pair b comma a falls on f inverse. Now, just a little bit of vocabulary here. Okay, I call this rascal the input. I'm going to put an I there. And then I call this rascal the output. In other words, the independent... Um, value is the input and then the whatever value you get uh, in place of the dependent variable is your output. Again, now if you come over here, now the B this time would be the input on this one and then A would be the output over there. So here's my rule. If B is the input for F inverse, then it is fair to say that B is must be what? Must be the output for who? Or f, of course. And that rule is really going to guide us through the next example. So our first function is a cubic function. And, and I'm telling you what, I promise you this, the AP is really going to go out of their way to make sure they give us a feisty enough function where you can't literally find the inverse function by hand. And that's what's going to be crazy here is there's no way that I can find the inverse function and yet I'm going to be able to find the derivative's value of the inverse at a specific moment. So let's say that they wanted, uh, for instance, let's say they maybe wanted the value of the derivative of f inverse at x equals 8. Okay, so that's the question that they've posed to us. So here's how I'm going to set it up. We've got our magical formula. We know that the derivative of f inverse of 8 should be equal to 1 over, all right, and now you're probably, you're, you're struggling here, you're like, oh, shoot, does, uh, you know, where does the F prime go? Does the F prime go inside or outside? Ah, just remember Tom Selleck and his favorite show, famous show, Magnum P.I. So the F prime goes on the outside, F inverse goes on the inside, and then we'll throw the 8 in there. Okay, so the real question becomes, how do I evaluate this rascal F inverse of 8? I can't even find the function f inverse, so how in the world am I going to substitute an 8 into a function that I can't even find? Well, here's the deal. If 8's the input of f inverse, then that means it's really the output of f. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to set the original f equal to 8. 
And this is not something we're going to solve algebraically. It's going to, it's going to be something we kind of solve mentally through some trial and error. And they've promised that x is going to be a nice value. So you just start plugging in really nice numbers for x in your head until you find a solution. You know, If I substitute a 0, does it work? No. However, if I substitute a 1 in for these x's, right here and, whoops, and right here, yeah, 2 plus 5 plus 1 equals 8. So I'm going to say x equals 1. So what do we got here? We've got 1 over f prime of 1. Now all I need to do is calculate uh, a very simple derivative of that polynomial. Off to this little scrap work off to the side, I'm going to say f prime is really 6x squared plus 5. And if I evaluate that rascal at 1, I'm going to get 11. So my final answer for this particular problem is not 11, but 1 over 11. All right, so just remember that there's a 1 in the numerator. It's very easy to forget, with all of our attention on the denominator here, it's very easy to forget that there is a numerator of 1. And I promise you this, if choice A on the multiple choice is 1 11, choice B is going to be 11. And if I had a nickel for every student who's chosen 11, I'd have retired years ago. Uh, but anyway, so needless to say, the answer is 1 11. Well, before we wrap up tonight's video, I want to touch on a few other real random derivative rules that there's a possibility we'll see. Well, first of all, let's start with a real popular one, just the natural log of u. And we're well aware that his derivative is the derivative of u divided by u itself. However, we have this very random one here, um, derivative of a log other than e. So maybe it's log base 2, log base 7, log base 10, who knows, but it could be something other than e, theoretically. Now, if I was in, uh, worked in Vegas, I'd say, yeah, there's not a very good chance we'll see one of these. You know, maybe there's a 15 to 20 percent chance we'll see it. However, we do want to be ready just in case it's there, because if it is there, it should be an easy one to gobble up. Now, the rule is, is 1 over the natural log of a, whoever the base is, times du over u. So you'll notice it's very, very similar to the previous one. In fact, it's equivalent to the previous one because if I applied this rule to the ln, then the natural log of e would be a 1 and that whole coefficient would be a 1. Now, I don't use this one very often, so even I struggle to memorize it. But here's what I do know. Again, relying on my knowledge of Algebra 2, I, there's this change of base rule that says log base a of u is really the natural log of u divided by the natural log of a. Okay, nothing fancy there, just an Algebra 2 rule. Now the natural log of a is a constant, so I can pull it out. So I've got 1 over the natural log of a times the derivative of the natural log of u. Oh, look at that. We know that, Bear. And so we've got your coefficient, 1 over the natural log of a, times du over u. So it's very similar uh, with just an extra little coefficient in front of it. If you want to see an example of what one of these might look like, real straightforward here. What if they said y equals uh, log base 8 of the quantity x squared plus 3x? Okay, no problem. His derivative is going to be 1 over the natural log of 8 times du over u, 2x plus 3 all over x squared plus 3x, and that's about as much work as we do on something like that. So again, kind of random, uh, you know, I, I would handicap it as a 15 to 20 percent chance we'll see that, but we'll be ready just in case. One more obscure derivative rule that has a 15 to 20 percent chance of showing up on the exam is the derivative of a to the u. Um, very, very similar to e to the u. So let's start off with e to the u, which is very famous and something we're very comfortable with. His derivative is simply e to the u times the derivative of u. So it's something we're, we're a big fan of. Now, a to the u is going to be very similar. Now, just to remind yourself, a is a constant, okay? A represents something like, you know, 2 to the u or 4 to the u or 5 to the u. And then the u is what contains um, your variable, all right? All right, so his derivative is going to be a to the u times du, so everything right now is identical, and then we're going to finish with the natural log of the base itself. Now, even that third component applies to the, the e to the u rule, because if I did the ln of e, well, that's just one, and so it wouldn't affect the outcome of the problem. So here's one more rule to kind of tuck away in your memory bank. We're going to try an example here really quick, and I'm going to give you a, a second option on how to attack it. All right, let's try... Hmm, what should we try? Maybe we'll try something like pi to the sine x power. So we've recognized it as a to the u because your base is a constant. So his derivative is going to be, well, the original function times the derivative of the exponent and then finish with the natural log of the base, which in this case is pi. 
Now, I, I always like to kind of have a backup plan because this is such a random one that, again, I don't uh, myself do the best job of memorizing it. So here's what I rely on. I actually use the trick, uh, the technique called logarithmic differentiation that we went over yesterday. Now, yesterday we said we're going to use it anytime you see a variable in the base and the constant, and in that case, logarithmic differenti differentiation is mandatory. However, it is optional on this one, even though the base is a constant. Watch. I'm going to go ahead and take the natural log of both sides. And what that's going to allow me to do here is, let's see, I got a, now I'm ready to take the derivative of both sides. We'll see if we get the same answer that I just got moments ago. We've got the dy dx divided by y. And then over here, you're thinking product rule, right? Well, here's the deal. The natural log of pi is a constant. All it is is a coefficient. So I'm just going to say, well, here's my coefficient, and then here's the derivative of sine. Boom, there it is. And then the last thing we're going to do is we're going to multiply y to the other side, and guess what y is? Well, yeah, y was, if we do that substitution here, pi times or pi raised to the sine x power, and now I've got a perfect match to the rule that I just used moments ago that was up here in red. So, a couple of obscure rules. Uh, we, we're real big, uh, we're a real big fan of natural log of you, uh, but sometimes I, we panic when we see log base a of you. Similarly speaking, we're very comfortable with e to the u, and now we need to be just as comfortable with a to the u. So, hope that helps. A couple of things to stick in your memory bank, and we'll see you tomorrow.